We've brought together a, a distinguished panel here of uh, Roger Sexton from Zacato, uh, a high quality LED module manufacturer, Mark Sutton Vane, who's the principal of Sutton Vane Associates, uh, a lighting designer, and Boris Pretzel, who's the, uh, the head scientist at uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum. So I'm just going to introduce them all together, and then Roger is going to give his presentation, followed by Mark, followed by uh, Boris, and then we can take questions from the audience. So after a 20-year career at Philips, during which time Roger worked closely with key specifiers and lighting architects, testing new concepts and features in both Europe and America, Roger Sexton joined Zacato in February 2008 as a key member of the management team. He is now Vice President of the Specifier Service at Zacato. Mark Sutton Vane Associates has designed lighting for a huge range of museum and gallery projects, including the Darwin Centre at the National History Museum in London, Leighton House Museum in London, the Museum of Liverpool, the National Museums of Ireland and Saudi Arabia, the Three Gorges Museum in Chongqing, China, and the Titanic Building in Belfast. Current projects include the design of all the lighting for the National Museum of Oman. Boris Pratzel is the most senior scientist in the Victoria and Albert uh, Museum and heads the museum's cons conservation science team. His responsibilities cover a broad range of strategic heritage scientist science issues relating to the storage, display and preservation of artefacts. Research interests include the interaction of artefacts with environments, lighting, colour perception and measurement. So, like I say, we'll start with Roger. Uh, and then with uh, Mark and Boris. Thank you. So thanks, uh, thanks very much, Paul. I'll kick off this session with ten minutes on uh, LEDs. I will make some parallels with the uh, with gallery lighting. I don't claim to be an out and out expert in gallery lighting, but it's been my pleasure to work with experts like uh, Mark and Boris. And I will also um, uh, uh, refer to, with permission, this, uh, the paper on Van Gogh from uh, Kuhn Janssens and uh, uh, Leticia uh, uh, Monaco, and some research from the Getty Institute, again with, uh, with permission from, uh, from Jim Druzik. So this slide, uh, there's a lot on it, but it, it sort of sets out my stall for the rest of the talk. Uh, damage from photochemical action, it's a process where a molecule undergoes an irreversible chemical change and the activation energy for this comes from the absorption of, uh, of a photon of light. It can be, as in this uh, picture here, it usually is fading, so a lightning or a yellowing, but it can also be a darkening or a hue change or an embrittlement like a, a, a surface cracking. Uh, this could also be, by the way, from radiant heating, but uh, more normally uh, uh, photochemical action. It's totally unavoidable and uh, what conservators have to do is, is prolong the onset of this uh, visual change. To give you some uh, units, uh, what uh, conservators normally do is design to a certain preservation target. As you can see from the table it could be 10 years or 100 years or 1000 years and try to make certain that in this time you don't get a just noticeable difference. Normally a just noticeable difference is uh, defined as uh, 1 to 1.5 delta E, CIE 2000. This is uh, L star, A star, B star. The L star is a, a, a lightness uh, uh, factor and A and B uh, are chromaticity coefficients, uh, uh, red, red to green and then yellow to blue. So it's a kind of vector taking into account changes of hue or lightness. Now there's three things that uh, a conservator has to look at. The spectral sensitivity of the, of the pigment or the varnish or what have you, and the amount of light, the dose, so how much light and for how long, and uh, also the type of light, the spectral power distribution. So you see from this table that, um, can you still hear me? It's working? Yeah. If, if the preservation target is 100 years, they will have uh, um, 
uh, uh, let's say, guidelines at 50 lux for, for 25 days per year to one just noticeable difference as I've defined by uh, this descriptor here. But remember, it also depends on the spectral sensitivity of the object, and this is uh, classified as highly sensitive or medium or low sensitive, and in fact, uh, these uh, are subdivided into ISO 1995 uh, standards, one being the most sensitive, two being twice as sensitive, down to eight. And the, this picture is not a, a, a random thing, it's a so-called blue wall test card. Each of the uh, different dyes used in the eight sections refer to the ISO 1 to 8. And the way that a conservator can test the, uh, 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 let's say, light sensitivity of an object is by putting a, 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 a prescribed dose of light, normally 150,000 lux hours, onto uh, this card, half covered up, and next to it, a, uh, the object concerned, the test object, also half covered up. And then at the end of uh, the light dose, you uncover it and compare the known fading with the blue wall test card to the, the object concerned. With this information, then they can start looking at uh, how to achieve this preservation target. So this sets out my stall for the rest of the talk. So now we get to the actual light dose itself. Point one is you must consider the irradiance and not the illumination. So not just the visible part of the spectrum, but what's happening at the UV end and the infrared end. And even within the visible spectrum itself, this is defined by the V lambda curve, it's defined by the photopic sensitivity of the eye. That's not necessarily the same, in fact it isn't the same, as uh, the actual potential of the light to cause damage to pigments. You see, I told you, the photochemical action is based on uh, uh, the activation energy when photons of light are absorbed. But not all photons have the same energy level. Shortwave radiation has a higher photon energy level. Uh, the energy is uh, Planck's constant times uh, velocity of light over wavelength. So it's inversional, pro inversely proportional to wavelength. The lower wavelengths have more energy. The blue end of the spectrum has more energy. Therefore, if you have something that absorbs blue, it's going to be more fugitive, more, more, uh, uh, it's gonna, the, the light will have a bigger effect on it. So in other words, yellows and red. They reflect yellow and red, they absorb the blue wavelengths. This is uh, uh, the flashpoint. This is where the damage occurs. And indeed, if we look at two recent papers, one from Ishii and others, that actually tested yellow dyes uh, used in uh, Japanese block prints and kimonos and that sort of thing. And the one that's uh, triggered this uh, whole discussion from Letizia uh, uh, Monaco and Kuhn Janssens at the University of Antwerp, they tested the yellow pigments in uh, Van Gogh paintings. So it's the yellow that's uh, uh, a prime area of concern. Both these papers, these are high profile papers, but others as well, showed that the, that the key findings were that yellow dyes with, blue, with the sensitive blue ball scales one to two were sensitive for radiant power at 400 to 500 nanometers, especially if there's abrupt peaks. So if we look at these two papers in a bit more detail, this is the one from Ishii from uh, 2008. She tested, uh, I think, 22 different dyes, but 15 of them were yellow dyes used in traditional uh, uh, Japanese artwork, block prints, uh, kimonos, this sort of thing. And she tested them with a set light dose, 150,000 lux hours, uh, uh, with uh, five different lead types. And the datum was from a previous paper testing with uh, fluorescent lamps. The way to read this is if we just look at the average, you see that um, uh, uh, the damage potential was about 0.69, or <laughs> it is 0.69, with uh, museum grade fluorescent lamp. Whereas with most of the LEDs, with the yellow dyes, it was more. Particularly this one, which has the highest uh, color temperature and this huge peak, remember I said between four and 500 nanometers, that's A and uh, 1.03 compares to 0.69. It was an issue with the sensitive yellow dyes used in Japanese prints. 
This is the paper that uh, uh, Paul referred to in his introduction. With permission, I'm showing some of the, uh, the pictures in this report from Letizia Monaco and uh, Kuhn Janssen. This is a painting by Van Gogh from the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. They took uh, uh, fragments from it and uh, tested them under different light doses, uh, uh, comparing with uh, blue wall test scales. And they found that certain lead, uh, certain uh, uh, chromate yellow uh, paints that have a higher sulfur content actually uh, faded very quickly within days if you had these uh, blue wavelengths. So here it is to start with. Under UV, it goes completely brown. Then more, uh, this was red light. It has no effect at all. So both these papers show that the real issue is, forget if it's LEDs, just it's the, the, the uh, uh, radiant power from 400 to 500 nanometers. So the amplitude and secondly, the, uh, the rate of change. If you have an abrupt peak, this is what can cause problems. They're not insurmountable problems. If uh, uh, the lead manufacturer, or it doesn't have to be leads, can deal with the wavelengths here, then you can get around these issues or negate them or, or minimize them. You can't completely, <laughs> you can't just cut them out. I mean, then you won't see the blues properly. It'll affect the CRI. You won't see it to the artist's intention. It will really affect the, um, uh, the viewing experience. But what you can do is control it. So here I give uh, two, two, two demonstrations. We made some measurements for this uh, presentation. Uh, I have used our module because I, I know about Zaccato modules, but I'm not saying Zaccato modules are the only ones where attention is played to the spectral power distribution for uh, gallery usage. In fact, at the end of the presentation, I show a couple more. So here, the, uh, the pink line is the, the spectral power distribution of uh, cool white lead, the one used in the Ishi paper. The blue line is the halogen datum, and the red line is the artist series module that, uh, that we've tested. You immediately see that below 400 nanometers, there's uh, 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 a lot less light with both the lead types than with, uh, with halogen. But uh, between 450, uh, uh, around 450 nanometers, there's much more light, there's twice as much light with the, uh, the cool white lead, and a much more oblique a much more abrupt uh, uh, increase. This is what's caused the problem that you saw in the Ishi papers. I think a far fairer comparison is to show uh, uh, the difference with a warm white uh, lead. Warm white leads are mostly used in museums now. Here you see, uh, uh, well, the halogen comparison is exactly the same. Still, there's more light around 450 nanometers, but it's nothing like the uh, huge difference with uh, the cool white lead. This is more of a fair comparison. So let's put these spectral power distributions to the test. First of all, we can uh, uh, test them via something that uh, conservators use as a first pass. And my favor is a first pass. They wouldn't uh, base the whole design on this. It's something called uh, the damage potential. Now, the way, uh, uh, let's say, the effect of light on a uh, object depends uh, on what light is absorbed. And this is a function of how, how does it respond to those wavelengths. And then what Dr. Professor Krockman did and the, the Berlin researchers about 30 years ago is found that uh, actually they, they, they studied 50-odd uh, types of textiles, art papers, uh, newspapers, etc., and found the actual shape of the curve, which is uh, exponential minus B. B is a wavelength uh, a coefficient depending on the uh, um, uh, substrate times the, the wavelength above 300 nanometers. It's, Below 300 nanometers is not, not in artificial light or daylight. So if you multiply the radiant power from a source by these curves, then you have, let's call it the uh, uh, damage flux. In exactly the same way, if you multiply the, the, the radiant power by the V-Lander curve, then you have the uh, uh, human eye sensitivity. The ratio of one to the other is called the damage potential. Simply that. 
you know per lumen what is going to be the effect, uh, uh, or you have an idea what the damage potential effect per lumen is of the light source, and you can compare one to the other and make judgments for the light doses in the museum. So using that formula, uh, indeed the worst case one with B equals 0, uh, 0 0.012, we had independently these measurements by art preservation services done with uh, UV block halogen, uh, uh, the module that I'm, the story I'm following, and uh, some fluorescent and daylight. And you see that with careful uh, 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 attention to the shortwave wavelengths, you can have a lower damage potential than the museum datum, which is uh, UV block halogen. I must say, and uh, nearly I forgot to say it, though I put it in red, this is uh, a broad brushstrokes uh, approach. In fact, every museum object has its own distinctive um, uh, 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 responsivity curve. So to go into a bit more detail there, here with permission from Jim Druzik at the uh, Getty Conservation Institute, I will show you some specific testing that they've just done for DOE gate re gateway report. These are the blue wall test cards that I mentioned in action. They're in an accelerating, uh, accelerated fading chamber. Uh, here's the, in this instance it is, the Zaccato modules, uh, uh, giving a, 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 a light dose. Of course, there's a diffuser over it, so you get an even dose on the blue wall test cards. So what they did for, I think, 880,000 lux hours is test with the blue wall cards as a datum all these 15 types of uh, uh, dye. Uh, commonly used traditionally by artists. They're not just out of thin air. They're from the Getty collection. So the ISO blue wall standards and these dyes. The testing was done with uh, a halogen uh, uh, datum with a MR16 museum grade uh, uh, lead retrofit lamp from CRS Electronics. And to continue my story, with the Zaccato uh, artist module. And the outcome was that either there was no difference compared to halogen, or indeed the fading was slightly slower. I should say, to be correct, it was slower after 1.6 delta E uh, 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 threshold. So it's a bit academic, but it is statistically significant. And Jim is now doing testing with other medium responsivity dyes to take this a bit further. So to conclude, I would say that um, uh, according to broad testing with a damage factor and according to specific testing done by the Getty on uh, relevant dyes, given attention to the spectral power distribution, no LEDs do not damage your masterpieces. Gallery, li gallery lighting. Does LED lighting destroy masterpieces? In contrast to Roger's uh, very detailed, scientific, and excellent talk, I'm going to talk about people and eyes and hearts and gallery lighting. In a gallery, there's a hierarchy. People come to see the masterpiece, but they'll be supporting information labels, panels, graphics, or whatever, and there is the surroundings of the gallery and the architecture. All these need to be in a visual hierarchy for the person visiting the gallery to see and to appreciate the masterpiece they've come to see. Some masterpieces are damaged by light. Quite a lot aren't. Stone, metal, it can happily sit in the desert for a thousand years in the sun and not have much damage, but lots of things that contain particularly organic pigments are damaged. That's what we have to be careful of. The trick is to have as little light as possible, and that's lux hours. As, f as small brightness as possible for as short a time as possible. And we can get around this by designing for the eyes of the visitors. There's a great tragedy 
in museum artifacts, in that we come to see these beautiful things. To see them, we see need light, and the light that is illuminating them and making us see them could be destroying them. And this often just makes me stop and think about lighting, and it's a real challenge for conservators and curators in museums. When I lit the terracotta warriors at the British Museum, that first warrior had 2,000-year-old paint on. We were not allowed to light him more than about 40 lux. That's very dim. But by designing the whole exhibition, so the people's eyes were well looked after, no one thought he was dim at all. In fact, they thought he was very bright. He was only about 40 lux. It's quite possible to have lighting that looks after these amazing masterpieces, and even though it's dim, people think it's bright. LEDs have got many advantages. They can make excellent quality light. LEDs don't make some new kind of damaging light. There's only one kind of light, and it's made by all the light sources available in our repertoire. Use the right tool for the job. It may be LEDs, it may be something else. If it is an LED, choose a good one. And think about daylight, and think about the visitor's eyes. This was set up by Rogers Company Zicato, and it was a test. These people here, they're all lighting design professionals, and that's a row of light fittings, some of which are LED, some of which are all kinds of other things. And us lighting experts couldn't tell the difference between the LEDs and the other light fittings. Good LEDs are so good that you can use them with confidence in a museum environment. At the Natural History Museum, we had to light a collection of incredibly delicate butterflies. These things fade unbelievably fast. We weren't even allowed to use LEDs because of the heat that LEDs give off. So choose the right light source for the job. The butterflies change as you push buttons and some are illuminated and others fade down. Um, Believe it or not, we lit these LEDs with tungsten, these, these uh, butterflies with tungsten halogen because we were able to retrofit them with LEDs when the LEDs got good enough to put into the light boxes. In the lighting of uh, Leighton House, Lord Leighton's incredible masterpiece of architecture, I needed to light that gold dome. I didn't want any modern light fittings visible anywhere. So, it's a little thing like an upside down jelly mold up there. It's surprisingly big. And inside it, we put lots of modern LEDs. And those things you can't see from below, but they light that amazing golden dome. Perfect job for LEDs. Daylight is a wonderful source. And, like the risks from bad LEDs, it can contain the particularly dangerous parts of the spectrum. So, in the Museum of Liverpool, where we wanted to have daylight, and crucially, we wanted the views out from inside the galleries of the uh, buildings outside, we looked at all sorts of daylight restrictions and ended up having a compromise where daylight was used, and LEDs were used, and the whole thing worked well. John Lennon and Yoko Ono's famous bed is lit in a way that it will not fade, even though it contains extremely delicate uh, fabrics from the 1960s. These bones at the Natural History Museum are also lit entirely by LEDs. Choosing the right LED for the job, making sure it has the right spectral output, making sure that it is right for the job and it will do a great job. This job 
I'm going to show you is a disappointment because I can't show you much due to security. But in the early stages of the exhibition, we used the whole mixture. We reused these historic lanterns. They've got LEDs in. LEDs are superb at lighting uh, modern graphics, uplighting the ceiling, providing the functional light for the floor. Choose the right tool for the job. And finally, you've probably seen this picture in your children's history books. It's the portrait of Henry VIII. Just at the very bottom, you can see tucked away behind that uh, barrier is a little metal construction that contains a dozen LEDs that shine up and just give a little bit of light to that amazing picture of Henry VIII. There's daylight coming in from the right-hand side. There's uh, tungsten historic fittings above. It's a real mixture. But we balanced the light sources. We just gave a little bit of lift to Henry VIII using the newest sources available, LEDs, and it gave the viewers a great experience. And it's all about that. We must light our masterpieces so the people visiting the galleries can see and enjoy them. Thank you. Um, I'm the last speaker for today, so we're nearly done for this session. Uh, we're running a little bit late, so I'm going to speak quite quickly. I'm Boris Pretzel. I work at the Victoria and Albert Museum. This is an image of one of our buildings, our main building in South Kensington. We have around about 80,000 objects on display in this building. We have 85,000 square meters of display space. We have, in the last 10 years, um, revamped 25 galleries, redisplayed 25 galleries involving around 40,000 objects. Here's just a highlight selection of what, some of my favorite. The kind of things that are important to note is we have gone from things predominantly in display cases to things predominantly on open display. But we've obviously, with the large number of delicate objects we need to look after, we have to be very aware of how light interacts with them and what people see, as Mark's already said. Uh, so, in the future plan, 11, 11 years of gallery redevelopment at the V&A, 12 years now, 25 galleries and 46,000 objects have been redisplayed. I don't want to dwell on that. This is uh, the LED spectral power distribution, which Roger has already shown, for a uh, very white, very bluish white LED. This is the one which caused all of the discussions, which in my mind were ill-informed and rather panicky. Um, this is, to superimpose on it, again, picture Roger's already shown, a warm, warm uh, white LED, one that's much more likely to be used in a museum. And this peak, if I can find the right button, well, you can't see because it's a screen. This peak is the peak which people were referring to with all the damage. Um, um, and I've just put over the top as well, this is daylight. These are all at 100 lux, just for reference. So if you wanted to illuminate something at 100 lux, these would be the incident spectral distributions for daylight, cool white lead, and um, the warm white lead. As I say, a lot of scare about those peaks. I'm just giving here, this is tungsten halogen. You've seen it before, daylight again. Uh, this is a museum grade of high uh, quality fluorescent lamp, Philips color 95. Not, it's a bit too white for the ones we would tend to use in a museum, but the only thing I wanted to show, these lamps have been used, fluorescent lamps, good fluorescent lamps have been used in museums since the 70s, certainly and they have lots of peaks in the high energy areas from the discharge that's going on in the fluorescent lamp. Over the 40 years of experience with fluorescent lamps, there's no big outcry saying, oh dear, within a day my fluorescent light has destroyed my objects. All light will destroy most museum objects. I have to disagree slightly with Mark there. I think it's most of them. Most things are light sensitive. It's only a question of how quickly and how long we want to keep things for. So you need to moderate the light and you need to control what people see. Uh, there is another thing, this is a piece of work we actually never did, but we wanted to do. Uh, this is, the, the curve we're seeing there is the um, sensitivity of the eye at reasonably high light levels. It's called the photopic sensitivity of the eye. This is 
energy coming in here, this is how much you respond to it. The peak is at 550 nanometers, thereabouts. That is where energy from sunlight is most predominant. That's why IRIs were developed. Uh, we have, th this is how we, the parts of the eye we see color with norm normal daylight vision. Uh, we also have parts of the eyes which are very sensitive at low light levels, they're called the rods, and they have a peak sensitivity at higher energy, so further into the blue. 507 nanometers here and as it happens it's the rod response which controls things like your pupil size and your pupil size controls your feeling your depth of uh, uh, depth of focus and your perception of brightness to a certain sense so it's your rods which respond to light and control your pupil size it's your cones which help you view colors um, and there, there has been some work done in America for very low light levels, the so-called scotopic levels, where only the cones are used, that's nighttime vision, security vision, that you can dose light with some high energy, extra high energy bit, that makes your cones actually reduce the pupil size and makes you think there's more light there than there is and makes people better at the visual task. So this is what they've done in security lighting. And we thought it would be quite an interesting idea to see if we can't do this in a museum. In the end, we didn't do it because it would mean illuminating at around about 460, 450 nanometers. And as it happens, that's where we get peaks from the fluorescence. So in a sense, we're doing this already. But what I'm saying is, you shouldn't go around saying, oh, it's 50 lux. You should go around saying, how bright does it look? And the object, as Mark so eloquently put it, minimum light, minimum time. Uh, these are, I'm just going to go very quickly through some things we've done at the VNA. These are miniatures uh, from the 16th century, Tudor miniatures in the British galleries. This case has a, um, an EMF sensor, so it senses your body as you approach. It's not, the, it's not a PID sensor, it's one actually senses magnetic fields. The idea is the case is dimly lit, but you can see what's in it. But as you approach it, the light levels come up to a reasonable light level and display these wonderful miniatures. Artists have known about different sensitivities to different pigments for a long, long time. And I'm putting up a quote here by Nicholas Hilliard. It's the, one of the most famous British miniature painters. So he wrote a treatise concerning the art of liming in, I think it's 1596, end of, end of the 16th century. And he says, and now for a word or two of colors, for which are fit and which are not, all ill-smelling colors, all ill-tasting, as orpiment, verdigris, verditer, pink, sap green, litmus, or any unsweet colors are naught for liming. Use none of them if you may choose. Those colors, actually, we know, are all very light sensitive. The unfortunate thing is, the very last thing is, he says, use none of them if you may choose. So you think Hilliard's miniatures will all be nice and light fast and show them in bright light. That's not true. This is a... Um, the uh, Armada jewel, and we found, for instance, and I, of course, shouldn't use the pointer because it's a screen, uh, we found a lot of orpiment in these flowers down here. So even though he knew which pigments were sensitive, which pigments were very light sensitive, he still used them, either because they were the best pigment to achieve a certain success, or because actually when he was writing his treatise, he was just trying to put his fellow uh, painters off using pigments that he wanted to use. This is um, an idea, again, from the British Galleries. British Galleries were opened in 2001. So this is Anne of Cleves, painted by Holbein down here. This is the picture upon which Holbein decided to bring Anne of Cleves over to Britain to marry her, and then decided she didn't look much like her picture after all, and in fact never consummated the marriage, and they ended up divorced. That Anne of Cleves outlived all of Henry VIII's wives. Um, this is in what's called a shadow box. So again, you can see it, but you can't see it very well. But next to the case, there's a handheld fiber optic torch. So if you want to see it, if you're interested in this object, you pull out the torch and look at it, and the light levels go up. It doesn't matter what light sources you're using. Fundamental rule is use a good light source, make things look good. Use it for as short a period as possible. But make sure it's inviting so people can see what they're doing. Uh, this was quite a, um, a brave experiment, I should say. This is the Kinder Transport für das Kind, the uh, display at Liverpool Street Station out in sunlight in a glass case. The idea was this, Floor Kent did this, 2003. The idea was they would take out the oxygen from the display case. This is a huge case and therefore things would not fade. Uh, it failed on two grounds. First of all, nobody could afford the maintenance to make sure that over a two-year period there was no oxygen in the case. And secondly, not all pigments stop fading if you take out the oxygen. Some do, some don't. Some fade faster without oxygen or change color faster without oxygen. So this was a, a brave, albeit 
rather failed experiment, I think, and I'm very pleased those aren't my objects. This is the kind of thing we do. This is the Buller's Wood carpet. This is the last carpet by William Morris, so uh, 1891. And this was going on display as a new object, so we wanted to know how this object responds to light because we can't really replace it. So we were doing some measurements on the back of the carpet. These are very long-winded, very precise measurements looking at the pigments, or in this case the dyes, in their current state. Uh, we've done that also with the r -double carpet, and I'm going to show you the results for the r -double carpet. This is the kind of thing we measure. So we're measuring exposure at the bottom versus color change in as good a color change uh, space as we can find, which at the moment is CIED 2000. Uh, the error bars are very well defined because of the way that so there's lots of complexity in the way the measurement's done. There are two things that I want to point out. First of all, in this, the Ardable carpet, and in other old carpets, and in other carpets with natural dyes in them, very often it's not the yellow or the red pigment in their current state, which is giving us the biggest change, the biggest change with time, it's actually the blues. So, is that short wavelength peak, which affects mainly reds and yellows, as Roger pointed out, the most important thing for us? Perhaps not. The other thing is, of course, we get this graph, but we don't know what are just noticeable changes, and we don't know if it's color dependent, and it could be anywhere, sort of anywhere in this range has been quoted in literature. So again, we did quite a lot of work on trying to define what a just notable fate is. Uh, we've put it at 1.5 delta E after a lot of experiment, but I just want to show you what 1.5 delta E is. This is a grayscale for assessing color change. 1.5 delta E on this scale is around about there. Can you see the difference between those two grays? I think everybody can see the difference between those two grays. This is about 0.8 delta E in this system. You think we should go nearer for this end than for that end, but not when you actually do the experiments. It's quite interesting. So what do we do? Well, normally when you talk about color, uh, noticing color difference, most color things are done on matching, how well you can match two colors. So here we've got a predefined color scale, which you'd have to predefine somehow, be it a Munsell scale, and you take your unknown color, and I put a black disc around it so you can't match them right next to each other, and you match it somewhere along the scale. And then you might also have a predefined it might be just a linear measurement. So you might say, this color is equal to four inches or 25 centimeters, whatever it is. It could be a new, some numerical measure on a predefined scale. It's all about how well you can match that color. Does it go here? Does it go further to the left, further to the right? The other way of doing it was with light sources. So you have a target color, you try and match it by changing light sources, and then you have some number how much energy you put in the red and in the green and the blue, you get a red, green, blue index. Again, this is about color matching. We're not so interested in color matching in the museum. We're interested in how people can tell the difference when things have changed. And there's no fundamental rule which says the two things are the same. So our experiments were along these lines. We would take lots of colors, little colors which are not very different, put them in ideal situations and ask lots of people um, how, if, whether they notice the difference and how easily they notice the difference if they did notice the difference. Do you notice the difference between these two? No, they are in fact the same, nominally the same. They're slightly different, but not so you could see. But if I change them for these two, can you see the difference? So you would have scored the first one one or zero for I can't really tell, and this one maybe four for I can tell very easily. Up to you, but you would certainly have said this one's easy and the other one's difficult, if not impossible. If you do that often enough, you can come up with a uh, a, a probability function. How likely is a set color going to be noticed by people? And we put the 50% point at somewhere between 1.2 and 1.7 delta E in this new color system. And that's where we come up with our just notable difference. So, the purpose of it is, this is the Ardable carpet. I said I was coming back to the Ardable carpet. We saw the reflections on it. This is the Ardable carpet on display in the Islamic Gallery at the V&A since about the beginning of the 20th century. Um, is it worth putting it on display? Can you actually see it? There's an awful lot of reflection. It doesn't look very good. This gallery was one of the galleries we redeveloped, opened in 2006. The Ardable carpet is perhaps the most valuable thing at the V&A, one of the most valuable things. It's certainly the most valuable textile in the world. It's the oldest carpet, 1590. Uh, yeah, 1590, I think. Uh, the oldest complete carpet in the world. And it's large, 10 and a half meters long, five and a half meters wide. So it's going to be, form a very central piece in the gallery. So we did a lot of work on how could we put it on display for the lifetime of a gallery, at least 25 years, 
so that we know we're not going to damage it more than an acceptable amount. We know we will damage it by putting it on display. How much is acceptable? For us, acceptable means one just notable change in 50 years. That means we would keep an object in good condition for two to 500 years, which we think is a, is a, is a good thing. So this now is, the carpet is off. It's at about 10 lux, very low light levels, and you can just about see the colors. On the photograph, it, it's exaggerated. And on the hour and on the half hour, the lights come on. This, this carpet is now at the same light level as the carpets which are permanently illuminated but it's really exciting to see the lights come on. So people come to the gallery just to look at the carpet just before the lights come on and really see the colors. And I've been told I've got no time left. I've got two, two slides left. Um, so this is a double very good effect. So it saves illumination for the carpet. It only gets illuminated for 20 minutes in any hour. And it also makes it more exciting to see. So it makes it something special. And here's my big but. This is my last two slides. My big but is... Um, we've already heard a bit from Mark about how the eyes work, so I have a, a question for you. This is meant to be a checkerboard. This is Adelson's checkerboard illusion. A checkerboard, two colours on it, black and white. Now, if this is, these are black and white, what colour is this? No, if it was black or white, what colour is it? Black, say black, black, okay. And this one, say white, yeah, okay, white. Now, um, are they actually different? Well, I've dropped down a square which I've roughly matched to this colour, now I'm going to move that square down to there. And they're not. Well, they are. You see them as different, therefore they are different. If you measure them, they're identical. I'll just take all the other colors away, and you'll see that without their surrounds, the colors now even look the same. So it is a philosophical question about whether they're different or not, but actually to measure them, they are the same. One last thing, this is um, called the, the lilac illusion. There's 11 lilac dots. I'm just gonna start moving them. Just look in the middle keep looking in the middle and don't blink and what should happen is you start start seeing a green green dots and then slowly all of the violet lo lilac dots should disappear until you see one green dot moving just in a circle and if that happens if you blink the lilac dots come back there's no green in this image whatsoever so what you see is not necessarily what's there um, and this is Jeremy Hinton's as I say lilac chaser those are just two of many many things which show you a bit more about how the eye works I've finished thank you very much indeed thank you